Y'all, I'm not even going to try to pretend that this video is going to be a reasonable length, so you might as well grab a snack, grab a drink, because we might be here for a minute. Hello, beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about all of the books that I read in the month of May. And this wrap up is going to be kind of interesting because I feel like May was an extremely long month in terms of reading. I was looking back at some of the books that I read in May and I didn't even remember reading them in May. Like it feels like it's been months since I read some of these books. So it's going to be interesting trying to review them and articulate my thoughts. So we're going to see how this goes. I have 14 books to talk to you about today and we're just going to jump right in. The very first book that I finished in the month of May, The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. So this follows our main character, Alex, and her dream has always been to become a published author. She works in publishing, but she's never actually had any of her own work published. And it's kind of a dying dream at this point, especially since over the past year, she's had extreme writer's block after a falling out with her best friend. But then she's given a once in a lifetime opportunity to attend a very exclusive writing retreat at the estate of her personal favorite author, Rosa Vallow. And Rosa Vallow is kind of a very outspoken feminist horror author. And this estate itself kind of has an infamous history in that some grisly death happened there once upon a time. And so you're following Alex as she's getting to the estate. She's meeting the other women. They're settling in and immediately a huge bombshell is dropped on them. They are told that while they are there at the retreat, they are not going to be allowed to continue with any of their works in progress. They are going to be expected to start a book from scratch. They are going to be expected to meet a minimum word count of 3,000 words a day. And by the end of the month long retreat, they are going to have a fully fleshed out novel. And the best novel is going to be chosen for a six figure life changing publishing deal. Now, naturally this changes the tone of the retreat. It definitely becomes far more stressful, far more competitive and you're seeing the women buckle down because all of them want this life-changing publishing deal. But it doesn't really take long for some weird things to start happening, for Alex to notice some interesting things about the estate and about Rosa herself. And after one particularly interesting night, I don't really want to say anything more about it, but one of the participants goes missing and Alex and the other women are determined to find her. But while they're looking for her, they uncover some very sinister things about the estate, about Rosa, and it goes from there. So this book is definitely different than I was expecting and I actually mean that in a really good way. I went into this thinking that it was going to be a very very Agatha Christie and then there were none type story where you have a small set of characters, they are trapped in an isolated setting and they start dying one by one. But that's not what happened in here. So overall, I applaud Julia Barks for making this story different than what I was thinking it was going to be. That doesn't necessarily mean everything really worked for me that happened in this story. There were just certain aspects that went into a weirder direction and there was also kind of an unnecessary story in a story type aspect as you're reading Alex's story that she's writing for the retreat in here as well. And I really don't think it was necessary and I don't think it added anything overall to the plot and the feel of the story. And furthermore, this is kind of going to be a little bit spoilery, but Julia Bartz is trying really, really hard to make you feel like the estate has something to do with the weird occurrences here. So she's really trying to convince you that the house is alive. It's a notorious estate where grisly and supernatural things have happened in the past. And so Julia Bartz wants to invest you in the idea that the house has something to do with the weird things that are happening. But she starts it, but she doesn't really see it to fruition. She doesn't do it enough or convince to make me as the reader believe that this truly is the house that is doing these things. So I feel like that was a fail on the part of Julia Bartz. So the execution on this was very lacking for me. I think that there could have been a lot more done with the story to make it stronger than it was. Ultimately, I did kind of enjoy the direction that Julia Bartz took and the fact that it wasn't a stereotypical Agatha Christie and then there were none situation, but there was a lot that actually didn't really work for me in the story. I ended up giving it a 3.5 stars. The next book that I read in the month of May was The School for Good Mothers by Jessamine Chan. I read this because it was the May selection for the Book War and Bitches book club on Goodreads that I help moderate. This story had actually never been on my radar before. It's not even really one that I heard of. So I went into it very, very blind. Ultimately, this is a slightly dystopian story. So it is set in the current period of time. The only real difference is, is that there is an extreme level of government oversight and overreach into parenting and the rearing of children. So it's meant to be a very exaggerated and somewhat satirical look and commentary on the unrealistic expectations of mothers and the scrutiny and judgment that they face from society, even from other mothers. So in this story, we're following our main character, Frida Lou. She is a 39 year old exhausted single mother of a toddler. She seemed to have what was a happy marriage until her husband unexpectedly left her shortly after giving birth to their daughter, Harriet. And so she's trying to navigate waters, co-parenting with her ex-husband while also working full time and things like that. So she's working from home several days a week so that she can spend a lot of time with her daughter. But after a recent bout of insomnia, she hasn't slept for a few days. Harriet is being particularly fussy. Frida 
Vegeta can't calm her down. She kind of reaches her breaking point. She just needs some peace and quiet. She needs some time on her own. And so she ultimately one day leaves Harriet in this little baby contraption where she can't go anywhere. And she heads out of her house with the intent to grab a coffee and to be back within a few minutes. But then while she's out, she realizes she needs to swing by her office because she desperately needs some hard copies of documents she doesn't have on her computer. Again, she's just supposed to go and she's supposed to be back within 30 minutes, but that doesn't happen. She gets to her office. She gets distracted by emails. And wouldn't you know, two plus hours have passed before she gets home. And by the time she gets home, there are police outside of her building. And it turns out that her neighbor kind of heard Harriet crying, crying, crying. She wasn't stopping. And so the police were called. In this world, Harriet was instantly taken away from Frida. And not only was Harriet instantly taken away from Frida, but Frida was basically not allowed to see or have any contact with her daughter. And she was kind of put like within this 90 day observation period where she was literally being watched at every single moment by Big Brother. Like cameras were installed in her home and everything like that. And so for these 90 days, she's being constantly scrutinized by child and family services. She's got this very apathetic and disinterested social worker that is in charge of the case that is actually kind of hindering her ability to see her daughter. And so it is just a mess. And at the end of these 90 days, Frida is determined to be a candidate for these new rehabilitation schools. These schools are basically where bad parents are sent to be taught how to be good parents. Frida is expected to be at this school for one year with little to no contact with her daughter. And this school kind of operates on the principle that being a mother should be these women's one and only joy, should be the main thing in these women's lives. They have no identity outside of motherhood. Ultimately, there really is no way to succeed just because of the extreme and unrealistic things that they have to go through in order to prove their worth as parents. So when this story started, I was actually very fascinated. I was really enjoying the writing style and I wanted to see where it went. I thought that the story had so much potential and I thought I was going to enjoy it a lot more than I was originally expecting. However, the momentum of the story very much stalls when Frida gets to the school. Like I said, she's supposed to be there for a year and it felt like I was reading about her experiences for a year because this book details every single month, every different lesson plan, all of the different things that Frida's having to do and learn in order to try to get back her child. And they're increasingly more ridiculous and extreme. What's even more ridiculous is that Frida is being taught how to be a mother by people who are not mothers. So it is just so wacky. And like I said, this is meant to be overly exaggerated and satirical. It's a commentary on how mothers are viewed by society, how extremely judged and scrutinized they are. And overall, I thought the premise sounded really fascinating, even though I myself am not a mother. I have kind of witnessed these things firsthand, but it just dragged so much once Frida got to the school portion. And the tone of the story was very emotionless and flat. It was very robotic overall. So you don't get a lot of connection to Frida, even though you're following her for this extended length of time. And that was only exacerbated by the fact that it was a third person narration. So you're not even in Frida's head doing a first person perspective. It is a very detached perspective throughout the entirety of the story. And I think my main criticism about this story overall was kind of the what's the point ending that happened. I don't really want to get into the ending because I don't want to give spoilers, but ultimately the ending was open ended and it doesn't really give me any kind of resolution and it doesn't make me understand why we went through this journey with Frida in the first place. Ultimately, this book just really, it didn't work for me. It had so much potential to be so much more and it just kind of fell flat in execution, tone. I only gave this one a three stars. I'm kind of disappointed by that considering how strong I thought that it started, but you know, it is what it is. So three stars. The next book I kind of picked up on a whim. It was The Last Invitation by Darby Kane. I was in the mood for a palette cleanser. I just really needed something that I knew I was going to be able to fly through. And it also kind of worked out because this book was the lowest rated book on my TBR and I was able to use it to satisfy the Riley Prompt for Slayer Fest. Now, really quickly, I just want to say that I have read two other Darby Kane books and I really enjoyed them both. And I think at least one of them was also one of the lowest rated books on my TBR at the time I read it. I don't really understand why her books are so lowly rated, but I just find them to be compulsively readable, really well crafted and well written. So when I saw this as the lowest rated book on my TBR, I was skeptical once again, just because of how much I had enjoyed her other two books. Now I will say that this is definitely my least favorite Darby Kane. Of course, I'll tell you why when I get into the review, but this ultimately is a story of two women. It's told from their perspective. The first you're following is Gabby. She is headed to her ex-husband's house to kind of hash out some custody arrangements for their teenage daughter. But when she walks into his home, he is dead. He has been shot. And when the police arrive, they believe it is suicide, but Gabby is absolutely adamant that her husband never would have killed himself. She does not believe that he killed himself. She is actually approached by a reporter who says that her ex-husband's death is just one in a long line of similarly mysterious deaths of these wealthy kind of business type men. And so Gabby is getting herself wrapped up in the conspiracy that is brought to her by this reporter. And they're kind of under the suspicion that this mysterious group called the Foundation has been behind the deaths of these men. Then you're following our second main character, Jessa, and she is an attorney. And at the time of the story, she is basically supposed to be a child advocate for this child that is being the victim of a very contentious divorce. And because Jessa believes that the husband and father of this little boy is absolutely scum, she's basically doing everything in her power to ensure 
ensure that he doesn't win. But he is a very wealthy and powerful man and he has the ability to kind of make Jessa's life a living hell. And so things for Jessa are starting to slide really, really downhill. And then she's ultimately approached by a former mentor, law school teacher, and current judge about joining the foundation. And the foundation is essentially a collection of people and they essentially met out justice to people who were not able to find justice within the legal system. And so she's kind of approached with a tentative offer to join. She kind of has to go through the initiation process and things like that. But the more that Jessa finds out about the foundation, the more she's really uncertain if she wants to have anything to do with it. She ends up partnering with Gabby. They knew each other from law school. They've kind of had a falling out. They're not close, but they kind of realize that each other are their only hope to figure out what the foundation is doing and to kind of stop them permanently. The premise of this sounded fantastic. It was reminding me of The Collective by Alison Galen, and I was hoping the execution of this would also be very similar to The Collective as well. Unfortunately, it was not. Where this ultimately fell flat for me was a lack of focus or clarity on the foundation. We were only given the most barest bones of information about what the foundation actually was and what their purpose is. So it wasn't a fully fleshed out idea. You definitely don't really know who the members of this foundation are, how they started, why they started, or anything like that. So it's just a very abstract idea for most of this story. And that really lacked something for me. I was hoping for a lot more clarity on what this was because when you're reading the synopsis of the story, you're getting the idea that the foundation is like a major part of this story, but they were just kind of in the background the whole time. And while their actions are definitely the catalyst for the things that happen in this story, I don't really feel you get enough to actually justify this story being fully about the foundation. The synopsis also gives the impression that Jess's entire perspective is focusing on her desire to join the foundation and her journey to do so, but that's not the case. She wasn't even really approached to join the foundation until quite a significant way through the book, and she feels quite quickly that the foundation isn't really for her. So I really feel like the synopsis of the story was kind of misleading overall about what you were getting in this story. So there was definitely a lot of potential here, and like I said, I really enjoyed Darby Kane in the past, and I was expecting just as much enjoyment from this as I had from her other books. It just didn't quite work out for me. The potential was there, but the execution fell flat. So unfortunately, this was another three stars. I started the month with very, very mediocre reads. All right, completely switching gears. The next book that I read in May was The Raven King by Maggie Stiefvater. This is the fourth and final book in her Raven Boy cycle. I needed to go ahead and read this, first of all, to obviously complete the series. It was also one of the books that I needed to read in 2023 so that I could finish the series. And this also satisfied the Slayer Fest prompt of the trio to read a book featuring a found family or a strong friendship group. So I'm glad that I went ahead and finished this one finally. I'm not really going to say too much about the story, obviously, because it is the fourth and final book in a quartet, but this is ultimately a young adult magical realism story. I am ultimately just very glad to be done with this series. I had lost a lot of momentum on it. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to finish it, but I knew I only had one book left. I have issues with magical realism just because I find them to be very, very metaphorical and whimsical, and that is certainly no exception with this story. A lot of the concepts in here are very abstract, and I just have a hard time picturing what is happening. I need some things that are a little bit either firmly grounded in reality or fully in a fantastical world. So a lot of the things that happen in here, I was having a really hard time picturing because it's definitely set in our world, but there are just magical things that are happening, and I couldn't wrap my head around a lot of it. But this is a big reason why magical realism doesn't always work for me. I really liked the vibes and the tones of the story. I absolutely loved the Raven Boys and Blue and their relationship, and I enjoyed following them on the journey, but just a lot of the details of the plot and the things that happened just basically went over my head, if I'm being completely honest with you. So I usually leave the Raven Boys books thinking, what the hell did I just read? And this one was absolutely the same way. I didn't even rate this book because it's certainly an it's me situation, not the book. I just couldn't appreciate it and love it like everybody else did. So I refrained from rating this one altogether just because I don't think it would be fair to do so, but I am definitely glad to be done with the series. The next book that I finished in May was Georgie All Alone by Kate Claiborne. I ultimately decided to read this because it satisfied the angel prompt for Slayer Fest to read a book featuring like a broody main character. And one of the main characters in here, Levi, definitely fits that bill. So this follows our main character, Georgie, and she has been a personal assistant to a movie star out in LA for several years, but that movie star has kind of decided that she wants a change. She wants to revamp her life. And so Georgie finds herself unexpectedly out of a job and she decides to move back to her hometown. I can't remember offhand where it is. It's definitely somewhere on the East Coast. And she has decided to move back there because her best friend has also moved back there. She's married, she's having a baby, and Georgie is going to go ahead and move back there and kind of help her friend out for the first few months after the baby is born. So she is heading back there. She's kind of lost and purposeless. She doesn't really know what she's going to do with her life going forward, but she's going to her hometown and she's going to figure it out. And while she's there, she plans to stay, of course, in her childhood home. Her parents are not there. They're kind of out traveling in an RV. So Georgie's going to be in the house on her own until one night she's there and all of a sudden a guy shows up. He has a key and he's let himself right in. And what Georgie's parents have failed to let her know is that they offered their place to Levi 
because Levi has helped them out with some things in the past. House is being renovated and he needs a place to stay. So Georgie and Levi kind of become unexpected roommates and you're following the progression from unexpected roommates to a little bit something more. Now Georgie is definitely familiar with Levi because not only is she the older brother of somebody that Georgie went to school with and somebody that Georgie had a massive crush on while she was in high school, but Levi definitely has a reputation in the town. He caused a lot of problems when he was younger and so he doesn't have the best reputation and he's completely estranged from his family basically. He hasn't talked to his family in about 12 years but he has done his best to kind of keep his nose clean, keep his head down. All he wants to do is live a very simple quiet life. He owns a business. He is a very decent man but the town has a long memory and they're not necessarily willing to let it go. So he's just kind of on his own doing his own thing. Then of course he meets Georgie and complications ensue. One of those complications is the fact that Georgie ultimately ends up getting a job at Levi's family's kind of hotel resort that they have. She has waitressing experience. They are short staffed and so they offer her a job. And so as Georgie and Levi are getting closer and closer, there is a part of her life that she can't share with Levi because of his estrangement from his family. So this ultimately really is just about the progressing relationship between Georgie and Levi. And then you're also of course watching Levi try to deal with his shit and what actually happened with his family. So there were some harder hitting elements to this story, but not enough to really be the gut punch that I was looking for when I read stories like this. So I loved Georgie and Levi and ultimately this was a very pleasant reading experience, but it's sadly not going to stick with me. In fact, I've already lost a lot of the details that I had while reading this story. I gave this a four on Goodreads, but the lasting capacity of this is probably closer to a three, 3.5. So sadly, I don't think that this is one that I'm going to hang on to. But like I said, while I was reading it, I was into it. It's just not one that's going to have a lasting impact, but it did satisfy a Slayer prompt. I'm glad to have another book that I physically had on my shelves done and read, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. So I still overall consider this one a win. The next book that I read for the month of May, Stay Awake by Megan Golden. This is the third Megan Golden that I've ever read, and I really enjoy this one, y'all. I think this is currently my favorite Megan Golden to date. I use this to satisfy the faith prompt in Slayer Fest to read a dark or taboo book. So this follows our main character, Liv Reese, and when the story opens, Liv is in the back of a taxi. She wakes up. She has no idea why she's in the back of a taxi. She can't really remember the night before, but the cab pulls up in front of her apartment, or what she thinks is her apartment, and she goes and she tries to get in, but she's finding that strangers are living there, and it looks like they've been there for quite some time, and she has no idea what is happening because she's at this place where she clearly has remembered living with her roommate for the past several years, and things are no longer what she remembers them to be. And she goes to call for help. Her cell phone is not there, her purse is not there, but what's in her pocket is a bloody knife, and she sees on her hands the words like, stay awake and wake up. And then fast forward a little bit, the next time you're following Livery, she is waking up on a park bench, and she has absolutely no memory of the night before. She has no idea why she's on a park bench, she has no idea why she has writing on her hands, and then you're also following a second perspective in here. You're following Detective Halliday and she has been called to the scene of a murder and there's a man in an apartment, he is dead, and on the window in his own blood are the words wake up. And so naturally you know then that Liv Reese has some kind of connection to this dead man but you don't know what it is. So you're following Detective Halliday as she's trying to identify the victim, trying to figure out who killed him, and then you're seeing Liv Reese as she continues to be completely confused. Her last memory was two years and three months prior. She works for this publication, she's sitting at her desk in her office and she gets a phone call that will ultimately change her life. And that is her last memory of two years and three months prior. So she's essentially now two years in the future and she has no recollection of what the past 27 months have been. And naturally that's a very disorienting and confusing feeling. So you're following Liv in the present and she's trying to figure out what is happening to her, but through her perspective, you're also getting flashbacks to the past, to the two years and three months ago, how her life was. She was working at Cultura, she had a boyfriend, she had a roommate, and you're following what her life was like then. But it's through Detective Halliday's perspective that you actually learn about who Liv is in the present day, what her life has been like, and why it is that she does not have memory of the past 27 months. It turns out that anytime she goes to sleep, she forgets absolutely everything. And so that's why there is stay awake and writing all over her. So through Liz's perspective, you're not learning about Liz in the present. You're learning about Liz in the past and as she's trying to figure things out in the present, but through Detective Halliday's perspective, you're learning about what's actually going on with her. I had an absolutely phenomenal time with this thriller. I think Megan Golden created a truly unique concept to create a very clever suspense thriller. And I really liked the way that Megan Golden used the two character perspectives. You definitely need both of these character perspectives in order to figure out what is going on. So I enjoyed this one immensely. Like I said, I think that this might be my favorite Megan Golden to date, and I will absolutely be picking up more from her in the future. I just thought this was so clever, so unique, so well done. It was definitely fast paced, compulsively readable. I wanted to keep turning the pages figuratively because I did listen to this via audio, but ultimately it was just a solid good time and I recommend this one. Ben still kind of 
writing the thriller high and wanting to continue in that genre, I ended up reading next Every Last Fear by Alex Finley. So this follows our main character, Matt Pine. He is an NYU student and he gets a devastating call one day that his father, mother, younger sister, and younger brother have been killed in Mexico while on their vacation. And the police think that it might be a gas leak. And so naturally Matt's life has completely fallen apart as he has to deal with the aftermath of his entire family's death. And unfortunately, Matt's family is really no stranger to tragedy because a few years prior, Matt's older brother, Danny, was convicted of murdering his girlfriend. And so he has been in prison for the past several years. And during this time, there was a documentary released kind of touting Danny's innocence. Like people think that he is innocent of the crime and he didn't actually kill his girlfriend. But Matt feels differently. He thinks that he witnessed something on the night that Danny killed his girlfriend that proves his brother is actually guilty and does belong in prison. So you're following Matt as he's trying to deal with the aftermath of his family's horrific deaths. And it's further exacerbated when there is a detective that actually believes that Danny's family was the victim of foul play, which even further complicates everything. So overall, I want to say that I had a fantastic time reading the story. There was one point when I was so engrossed with what was happening that I actually missed my turn for work and I had to go out of my way to get there because I was just so invested with what was happening in the story. I ultimately thought that this was very clever, well-crafted, definitely well-written, and I had a great time with the story. My complaint with this is that there was a lot happening because you're not just getting Matt's perspective or even just the detective's perspective. You are getting the past perspectives of his mother and what she was doing in the events leading up to her death, his father, what he was doing in the events leading up to his death, and his younger sister and what she was doing in the events leading up to their death. So there were a lot of little smaller side plots going on there and other characters that you had to pay attention to and you really did need to kind of keep your eye on those because you didn't know what was important and what was going to play into their deaths. So there was a lot more going on here than I thought needed to be. I just found myself a little bit overwhelmed by all of the perspectives, all of the side characters, all of the little things that you had to keep track of and you never really knew what was important, what was a red herring, what you could let go of. And I just thought that there might have been a little bit more of a straightforward way to tell the story. Now, of course, I understand why Alex Finley decided to choose those literary devices to tell this story. He wanted you to be on your toes. He wanted you to be confused about what could have possibly happened so that there was a shock factor by the end. But by the end, I just really didn't know what was important or what wasn't important. And so it kind of lessened the impact of the big reveal at the end, if that makes sense. But I still really, really enjoyed my time while reading this. And I will certainly be reading more by Alex Finley in the future. His new release is certainly on my TBR and I will read that just whenever I can. So while I do have technical complaints about this story, ultimately, I still think it was very, very well done and I can see him becoming a favorite in the future. All right, and this next one, I didn't start it in May, but I finished it in May and I'm quite proud of that accomplishment. Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. I started this in late March. This was meant to satisfy the final Slayer Fest prompt to read the biggest book on my TBR. This is a thousand seven pages. As you can see, I tabbed the heck out of this. This is an incredibly slow burning, complex, very detailed, high, high, high epic fantasy by Brandon Sanderson. And I just really took my time reading it and enjoying that reading experience. I ultimately finished it a lot sooner than I thought that I would. But once I got into it, it was a lot easier to fly through. I did a lot of studying while reading this book, studying the wiki that is devoted to this in order to kind of understand the world and the character and the context and the history. Because Brandon Sanderson does not do any info dumping, which I kind of prefer at the beginning of a fantasy to give you the contextual information about the world. So I had to piece a lot of things together just so I could enjoy my reading experience because I don't like being confused when I'm reading. I like to have a lot of information up front so that I know where everything fits in the world and things like that. So this was just ultimately an experience. I wouldn't even know where to begin telling you what this book is about. So let me just let me just read the blurb here. Roshar is a world of stone and storms. Uncanny tempests of incredible power sweep across the rocky terrain so frequently that they have shaped ecology and civilization alike. It has been centuries since the fall of the ten consecrated orders known as the Knights Radiant, but their shard blades and shard plate remain. Mystical swords and suits of armor that transform ordinary men into near invincible warriors. Men trade kingdoms for shard blades. Wars are fought for them and won by them. One such war rages on a ruined landscape called the Shattered Plains. There, Kaladin, who traded his medical apprenticeship for a spear to protect his little brother, has been reduced to slavery. In a war that makes no sense, where ten armies fight separately against a single foe, and to fathom the leaders who consider them expendable. Bright Lord Dalinar Colon commands one of those other armies. Like his brother, the late king, he is fascinated by an ancient text called the Way of Kings. Troubled by overpowering visions of ancient times and the night's radiant, he has begun to doubt his own sanity. Across the ocean, an untried young woman named Shallan seeks to train under the eminent scholar and notorious heretic Jasna Colon, Dalinar's niece. Though she genuinely loves learning, Shallan's motives are less than pure. As she plans a daring theft, her research for Jasna hints at secrets of the Knights Radiant and the true cause of the war. The result of more than 10 years of planning, writing, and world building, The Way of Kings is but the opening movement of the Stormlight Archive, a bold masterpiece in the making. Well, there you have it, folks. Like I said, this was just an experience 
experience and I couldn't give it any less than five stars. By the end of it, I felt like I was leaving behind friends and I can't wait to get back with them again. This is one of the biggest, most complicated fantasies that I've ever read. I think it even surpasses Game of Thrones in my opinion, so it's quite the literary accomplishment. Believe it or not, the other three books that are released in this series are longer than this one. So this is certainly an investment, but it is one that I'm prepared to make. I'm so glad that I read this. I'm so glad that I finished it and I can't wait to be back with Kaladin, Dalinar, and Shallan in the future to see what actually happens. I'm here for the ride. So I'm so glad that I finally finished this and like I said, it was an easy five stars for me. And then the next book that I listened to on audio after finishing Every Last Fear by Alex Finley was The Martian by Andy Weir. This satisfied the Slayer Fest prompt of Robo Buffy to read a science fiction. This is one that I also had on my TBR to satisfy the prompt of reading an overhyped book. And this is definitely one that I wanted to read in 23 because I wanted to know more about Andy Weir as an author, especially about hearing so many amazing things about this story. This book, if I had to summarize it in one sentence, would be Cast Away in Space. It is ultimately the survival story of Mark Watney as he is accidentally left behind on Mars. He is on a mission with several other people to Mars, but when an unexpected and extreme dust storm happens, he is kind of impaled by an instrument on Mars and everybody thinks that he is dead. And so they take off, but Mark is very much alive. And so he has to use his engineering and science background in order to stay alive on Mars. So naturally, a lot of very clever and creative things have to happen in order for Mark Watney to survive. And so what does that mean? A lot of science and math. So this story is essentially told through log entries that Mark Watney is making on Mars. And so he is going into sometimes very painful detail about the actions that he is taking to survive on Mars. And so there's a lot of chemistry and physics and calculus and just math in general. I as a layperson did not understand any of it. And so naturally I am just in awe as to how smart you have to be to work for NASA and be an astronaut. But a lot of it of course just went right over my head. And sometimes it was very dry. It was hard to picture. There were two things that ultimately saved this book for me. First was Mark Watney's humor and the second was the audiobook. I for sure would not have been able to read this book if I had not listened to it via audio. Will Wheaton was the audiobook narrator and I feel like he did such an amazing job of capturing Mark Watney's personality and bringing his voice to life. He was able to capture Mark Watney's humor which was definitely so sarcastic and which I really loved. I related to Mark Watney's humor a lot in this story because I can imagine myself being the same way. I'm the person that no matter how inappropriate the situation is I'm gonna crack a little joke about it. And so that was basically Mark Watney the entirety of the time that he was on Mars trying to survive because he ultimately thought that his death was imminent. In addition to Mark Watney's perspective, you are also getting several people back at NASA who realize that Mark Watney is alive through satellite images and what they are trying to do to save him. Through the audiobook and Mark Watney's humor, I was able to fully really enjoy this story and understand why people love it so much. Towards the end of the story, when we were getting towards like the rescue mission that was going to save Mark, I ended up getting a little bit emotional, getting a little bit teary because I was so invested and I wanted Mark to be okay. I wanted him to get off the planet and I had no idea how it was going to end. So ultimately I gave this a four stars. I understand why everybody loves it and you certainly don't need to understand the math or the physics in order to get through this book. It would have never been published if that would have been the case because that's not the point. The point is Mark Watney getting invested in him as a character and just realizing the harrowing things that he has to get through in order to survive on such an inhospitable planet. So I really did end up enjoying my experience of this in the end. Like I said, I gave it a four stars. I will absolutely be willing to read more from Andy Weir in the future. In fact, I put Project Hail Mary on my TBR. Ultimately, all I can really say about this is that it was quite the ride. I'm glad that I read it and I will read more from Andy Weir in the future. Then after completing The Martian, I ended up picking up How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. This hand needs a break, y'all. This hand is gonna have to hold the books for a minute. So I use this to satisfy the prompt of Adam to read a horror novel and that's definitely what this was. So this follows our main character, Louise, and her parents unexpectedly die in a tragic car accident. She is currently living in California with her daughter and she is now having to fly home to South Carolina to kind of deal with their estate and take care of it. She's definitely encountering some issues while doing so because her brother Mark is just kind of wanting to bag up everything in the house, sell the house, get it out of the way, get it done. But Louise doesn't want that to happen. But yet she also doesn't want to deal with this home that is packed with her mom's lifelong obsession with puppets and dolls. And soon some really creepy and weird things start to happen while she is in the house trying to get it ready for selling. And y'all, I really don't want to say much about this book. All I'm going to say about this book is haunted puppets. And I think that is all you really need to know when going into the story is haunted puppets. I absolutely love Grady Hendrix. Grady Hendrix has this magical way of writing stories that are obviously supposed to be horror, but there's also a lightness to them and some of the things that happen and some of the conversations that occur in these stories. But there's also some harder hitting elements that are going on in here as well. So there's just a mixture of light and dark horror and creepy, but funny as well. And I just think that he does that balance so tremendously beautifully. This isn't my favorite Grady Hendrix because I'm not really big on the whole puppets and dolls thing. I thought that some things that happened in here got very, very weird, 
very quickly, but it was still a damn good time. If you like horror, you can't really go wrong with Grady Hendrix. You can't go wrong with this story, but I don't really want to say more about this overall. I think you just need to go into it and enjoy the ride that was this book. And if you have a thing about puppets or dolls, maybe don't read this one. All right, completely switching gears, I ended up picking up Chasing River by K.A. Tucker. So this was another one of the challenge prompts that I pulled for myself in May. It wasn't something that I was really in the mood to read, but I had to go ahead and get it done because it's something that I needed to read. It was a continuation in her Burying Water series, which I had enjoyed the first two books previously. And so I just needed to get it done because I didn't want to carry it over into another month. This book follows our main character, Amber, and she is currently out exploring the world. She has dedicated several months to exploring several countries abroad. And at the start of the story, she is heading to Dublin, Ireland. And one day she is going out to kind of be a tourist and she is walking along when somebody basically out of the blue tackles her to the ground. And immediately after that, a pipe bomb explodes. And so basically this mysterious stranger saved Amber's life. And that stranger is River Delaney. He currently helps run his parents' bar called Delaney's. He was there in the park that day because he knows who set the pipe bomb. It was his brother. His brother has connections to the IRA. He's a very dangerous group and his brother's a very dangerous person. And so they were setting the pipe bomb off in the park as a political message. It wasn't meant to hurt anybody. Nobody was meant to be around, but River was very suspicious of this. And so when he saw that Amber was walking that way, he basically saved her life. She basically ends up tracking him down to his family's pub because of the shirt that he was wearing. And it definitely goes from there as they start to develop a relationship. And as the Bering Water series is kind of classified as romantic suspense, there's definitely going to be some darker, more thrilling aspects to the series. And in this case, it was River's brother's connection to the IRA and the complications that makes for River and his family and the danger that puts him and Amber in during the time that she is in Ireland. This was probably my least favorite so far in the Burying Water series. I enjoyed the other two stories a lot more. And perhaps the main reason I say that is because this felt very insta-lovey to me. Amber is only supposed to be in Ireland for a total of about 10 days. And by the time she actually tracks down River, she's already been in Ireland two to three days. So she's supposed to leave in a week's time, but already she and River are striking up a relationship and they are starting to get hot and heavy and serious. So much so to the point where after like only three or four days, she is considering changing her traveling plans. You know, she's supposed to go off from Ireland to other countries and she's immediately thinking about changing her plans. And so it was just all very, very quick for me. It wasn't like they were declaring their undying forever love to each other in the story, but it was almost like from zero to, okay, I want to stay with you indefinitely. And that was just a little bit too quick. And listen to what I wrote in my Goodreads review. Picture it. Girl almost gets blown up, but is saved by a good Samaritan. Girl tracks down good Samaritan, finds out he is a hot Irish bar runner, and flirtation ensues. After a few days of getting to know him, girl sleeps with good Samaritan and contemplates changing her world travels for him. Girl is thrust into intense situations because of good Samaritan's brother and his affiliations with the IRA. Girl is a rule follower, preppy, never been in trouble before, and is bothered by good Samaritan's affiliations, but ends up overlooking it all, even when the good Samaritan himself is almost blown up. Ultimately, after just a week, girl knows that she cannot walk away from good Samaritan, and basically her whole life is uprooted as she tries to make a relationship with him work. I wanted to read that because I feel like it's a pretty apt and succinct review of what this story was. Even though I liked River and I liked Amber, and of course you're going to root for them together, it was cute, and I mean, who doesn't dream of falling in love with an Irish bartender? I just think that the execution could have been a lot stronger. So I ultimately gave it a three stars. Also, I guess now is an appropriate time to mention that the third challenge poll that I pulled for May was another K.A. Tucker. It was called One Tiny Lie, which was the second book in her Ten Tiny Breaths quartet. I ultimately ended up deciding to DNF it because that was just going in a direction that I didn't like. It was very superficial, very surface level. There was some cheating going on in there. I thought that the main character was going to do some really ridiculous things and I just didn't see how the main love interest was supposed to redeem himself given how much of a player and cad he seemed to be. I don't really want to say anything more about it because it's not worth it. I typically really enjoy K.A. Tucker's books and in fact I would say she's probably solidly one of my favorite contemporary romance authors of all time especially after the Simple Wild series but the Bearing Water series and Ten Tiny Breaths series are older. They're about a decade old at this point. Some of them especially like One Tiny Lie just didn't age well especially in comparison to what I know that K.A. Tucker can do today. So while I will absolutely be continuing the Bearing Water series I will not be continuing with the Ten Tiny Breaths series. After finishing Chasing River I decided to go ahead and pick up The Soulmate by Sally Hepworth. This came in from my library so I felt like it was a good time to just go ahead and get it out of the way. It was a recent book of the month selection and y'all know I'm trying to read these as soon as I can when they come in. So it was the perfect opportunity. I was in between books. Wanted again another little palette cleanser. This follows our main characters Pippa and Gabe. They are a happily married couple with two small children and they have lived in this quaint cottage on a cliff for the past year. But what they didn't know when they purchased this cottage was that it's a notorious suicide jump spot. And so over the past year Pippa's husband Gabe has found himself on the edges of cliffs with suicidal people trying to talk 
lock them down and for the most part he has been fairly successful until one night he isn't. Gabe is out there talking to a woman and she ultimately ends up taking her life and this ends up ultimately thrusting them into a police investigation. Of course the police are called. They start to notice some funky things about Gabe's story and they start to investigate what actually happened especially when it comes out that Gabe actually has a connection to the woman that jumped. So this story is kind of told from two perspectives but four timelines. So you're following Pippa in the present and then Pippa in the past. Like you're following Pippa's relationship with Gabe and all of the trials and tribulations that they had to overcome to be where they are today. Let's just say that Gabe was not the best husband and the fact that Pippa stood by him was very very angelic of her. And then you're also following the perspective of the woman who died. So you're following her yes from a past perspective but you're also following her in the present after she has died. So she's kind of like in that limbo space and you're watching her as she's seeing everything that's going on after her death. I'm gonna be honest and I really just don't have a whole lot to say about this. I thought that this was a fairly solid and engaging reading experience. It's not very long. It was certainly easy to fly through. It was engaging. I was never bored. I never wanted to put it down. There was nothing inherently wrong about this story, but it was just not anything remarkable. I found the story itself, plot, the writing, the characters to be very basic, very simple. There wasn't anything about this that really stood out to me as unique. What ultimately kept my attention was just kind of wanting to know what Gabe's connection was to this woman, trying to unfurl the mystery basically as it happened. That is what kept me going. But was this a memorable story to me? I don't think so. I don't think that this is one that is going to stick with me. So I gave this a 3.5. I didn't feel like it was quite worthy of a three because I enjoyed it a little bit more than I would a typical meh three star read, but it's definitely not a new favorite or anything. The next book I picked up was The Things We Cannot Say by Kelly Rimmer. I picked this up because it's actually June's Bookworm Bitches book and it came available from my library. So I wanted to go ahead and just get it done because I knew I was gonna have to read it for June anyway. This is a historical fiction. It's by an author that I had never read from before and I was pleasantly surprised by how much I ultimately enjoyed this story. This is set in two time periods. The first is 1930s Nazi occupied Poland and we're following our main character, Alina. She is the daughter of Polish farmers. She is the youngest of three. She has older twin brothers and she She's always been the very protected, spoiled daughter, and that also makes her somewhat naive. But she's kind of forced to grow up very quickly when the Nazis start to occupy Poland and things start to change very drastically, very quickly. Her twin brothers are sent away kind of to work for the Nazis on a work camp, and Alina becomes the sole child there to help her parents with their farm. And on top of that, she's missing her fiance, Tomas. She and Tomas were childhood friends that grew into something more, and he left for medical school, and he was in Warsaw, Poland at medical school when all of this started to go down. So she hasn't seen Tomas in a while. She hasn't heard from him. She doesn't know whether he is dead or alive. So she is going through a lot during this time. When the story starts, she is only 15 years old and you're following her over a few years during the time of the Nazi occupation and World War II. The second perspective is in present day Florida and it's following our main character, Alice. And she is definitely struggling with her domestic life. She has a son on the autism spectrum who has very specific needs and routines in order for him to basically function and not have a meltdown. On the opposite end, she has an extremely gifted gifted daughter which comes with its own challenges and her marriage with her husband is kind of in crisis because her husband who is also a very intelligent man himself connects more with their daughter than their son and he really makes no effort to have a relationship with his son so a lot of that is all put on Alice and things go from very bad to worse when her 95 year old Babsha or grandmother has a stroke gets put into the hospital and she can really no longer communicate she can no longer speak but through assistive technology that Alice uses for her nonverbal son her grandmother is kind of insistent that Alice Alice returns to Poland. There is something that she needs Alice to do or find for her in Poland and Alice doesn't really feel like she can resist this request. She knows that her grandmother is not long for this world. She's likely going to pass away very very soon and there's obviously something that her grandmother wants finished. There's some unfinished business in Poland and so Alice takes it upon herself to go to Poland and try to figure out what it is her grandmother needs because she's still not clear on this because like I said her grandmother can't communicate. So at this point not only is Alice terrified to leave her family because she thinks that everything is going to fall apart while she is in Poland, especially given her husband's lack of relationship with their son. She owes it to her grandmother to do this, but yet she doesn't know what she's looking for and she doesn't know what answers she's trying to find. And so you're following her in the present day as she's going to Poland and as she's uncovering secrets and she's finding answers to long buried questions that she didn't even know were there to ask. So she's finding out a lot about herself and her grandmother and their history and heritage and ancestry. So Alice is learning a lot on this trip to Poland. I thought that this was beautiful. It was stunningly written. It was poignant. It was harrowing and I really enjoyed the stark contrast between the past perspective and the present day perspective. The modern challenges that Alice was facing in comparison to the challenges that Alina was facing in Nazi occupied Poland. And I'm not gonna lie, this one had me tearing up at points, especially near the end when 
everything was coming out, I found myself getting a little bit choked up because it was absolutely beautiful and astonishing to think of what Alina had to survive in Nazi-occupied Poland. I loved this far more than I was expecting to. Kelly Rimmer is now certainly on my radar. I have other books that I have now added to my TBR. She has a new one that's coming out in July, which I'm very excited about now that I know her capabilities as an author. So I'm glad that I gave this one a shot. If you are a historical fiction lover, you've never read Kelly Rimmer, absolutely give this one a try. All right, y'all, we've made it. The final book that I read in the month of May, I have some questions for you by Rebecca Mackay. And y'all, I am surprised to say that this book only got three stars from me. And even three stars, I feel like might be a little generous because this book was a mess. I say that because this story was trying to do way too much and it ended up being a you can't see the forest through the trees type of situation. So when you're going into it, you're definitely expecting a more literary style mystery with some dark academia tones. You're following our main character, Bodhi Kane. She is a successful podcast host in LA and she is returning to her former boarding school in on the East Coast. I think it was in New Hampshire because she's going to teach a class on podcasting. And back when Bodhi Kane was at Granby, the school, her former roommate, Talia Keith, was killed. She was found in the pool and Omar Evans, the school's athletic director who was black, was fingered for the crime. But since then, there has been a lot of outrage over this. They feel like Omar was kind of railroaded into a false confession, that there wasn't really a case against him. There definitely wasn't a lot of physical evidence. And there are a lot of people who believe that Omar was wrongfully convicted. Though Bodhi has definitely thought about it since her time at Granby, it's not something that has really influenced her life overall. But now that she's returning and she's teaching a class on podcasting, one of her students actually chooses the Talia Keith murder as the focus of her podcast because this student is one of those that believes Omar is innocent. And so naturally, Bodhi Kane finds herself very wrapped up in this case. She's seeing it differently through her own adult eyes. And of course, she's seeing new perspectives through the eyes of her students. And she comes and she becomes very invested and very obsessed. But she also has to keep some distance because this needs to be her student's project. Okay, so I said that this book was chaotic and it was trying to do too much. What do I mean by that? First, while this book is entirely told from Bodhi Kane's perspective, it is not told in a traditional first person or third person style. Rather, this story is being narrated as if Bodhi is telling the story herself to one specific person. I'm not really going to go into the, who the person is because you do find out in the story and that character ends up kind of being an important character to what happens in here. So I'm not going to go into it. But because of this, she will suddenly break the flow of her narrative to say things like, do you remember or you did this? And it'll constantly remind you that she's actually narrating the story personally to somebody else. I have no idea why this story was told that way. I don't think that it needed to be there. It certainly didn't add absolutely anything to this story. And there wasn't even a conclusion to that narrative. Part of me kind of understands why, because Bodhi is trying to kind of call out this person for very specific reasons, again, that you find out in the story, but it did not need to be told that way. So I felt overall that that was just very, very distracting. It could have easily been told from Bodhi's first person perspective, and it would have been just fine. Another interesting piece about this story was that there were specific chapters dedicated to theories of what could have happened. So you would have a chapter labeled after one character, say Robbie, the boyfriend of Talia. And that entire chapter would be nothing but a speculation about how Robbie committed the crime that night. And I mean, I guess that was an interesting literary device to use, but again, not necessary. It could have been omitted completely. This book also was not so subtly used as a platform for social commentary for a lot of issues. I wrote them down, gender norms, racism, cancel culture, sexual assault, predatory teachers, the Me Too movement, Just Believe Women, and even COVID is mentioned in here. COVID gets some page time in this story. And she presents all of these social commentary issues in a very heavy handed way, but yet without diving deeply into absolutely any of them. It seems like she is trying so desperately to be clever and insightful and offer deep commentary on these issues, but yet she doesn't succeed at any of that. And ultimately just ended up failing to convince me what I was supposed to get out of this novel with all of this commentary, because there was certainly nothing revolutionary revealed in this story. There were also an incredible amount of characters mentioned because Bodhi Kane is basically reliving her entire time at Granby and going through her entire high school experience there. And so naturally she's talking about all of the people that had some kind of involvement during that time. And so not only are you meant to keep track of these characters, but the relationships that they have with each other, the potential connection to Talia's crime, where they were the night that she died. And it was just a lot. There was so much to keep track of. There was also very little differentiation between when Bodhi would be in the present with the present day issues and when she would be flashing back to the past. It wasn't differentiated like a past chapter and a present chapter. And I don't think that there needed to be, but I kind of felt disoriented, especially while listening, because sometimes I would never really know what she was talking about the past or the present because they're both set at Granby. You know what I mean? And they're both kind of centering around the Talia Keith crime. And y'all, to be honest with you, this book was way too long. This book was a 14 hour audiobook, and it didn't need to be that long. And that just added to the chaos. Like she was 
was just putting all of this stuff in there to fill the pages. There was just so much going on in here, so much that didn't need to be in here. And I was just left completely flabbergasted and confused by what I was supposed to get from this story. And I couldn't even really tell you like what the vibes were. It definitely didn't feel dark academia, even though it was set at a school. It doesn't give you the vibes. It certainly wasn't suspenseful or thrilling. It was certainly on the more literary side and there was definitely some kind of a mystery, but it didn't even feel all of that mysterious, to be honest with you. It just seemed like it was this convoluted tale of a middle-aged woman who seemed to want to solve a cold case, but one that she wasn't even particularly invested in. Like she didn't, she wasn't even really great friends with Talia. They just were roommates for a time. They weren't close. And for the entirety of the time, she kind of thought Omar was guilty. So I don't even know why she ended up being so invested or obsessed in the crime, to be honest with you. I really want to know about some of the creative choices that she took with this book, because it didn't make a lot of sense. It could have been so much better. It could have been so much stronger. It could have been more reminiscent of if we were villains or in my dreams, I hold a knife or something like that, but it just wasn't. I really wish that there had been more focus on the Talia Keith crime and investigating that crime rather than all of the other bullshit that was within the story, including Bodie Kane's personal issues. There were personal issues that she was having like with the person that she'd been having an affair with and then her ex-husband's drama that he was going through as well. I don't even understand why any of that was in this story because it added absolutely nothing to it but to add to the chaos. So I have a lot of thoughts and feelings on this story. I was expecting it to be a lot stronger. I was expecting to enjoy this far more than I did and I just did not. So I gave it a three stars. Personally, I do think it's a little bit more memorable than a three stars just because of all of the nonsense that happened in this story. And I didn't hate it enough for it to be a two or a 2.5 because there were times when I was legitimately interested and invested, but I would constantly get distracted by all of the other stuff that was put into the story that didn't need to be. So three stars. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I read in May. Not gonna lie, I felt like this video was kind of a shit show. I struggled so much to get a lot of these reviews out. That's just what happens when I have so many and it's been several weeks since I've read some of these. So I apologize. I did my best. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books and what you thought. I would love to know even if your opinions differ from mine. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending on what I can do. And I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys. Thank you.